Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Lunch with a Friend series of live uh, video presentations. I'm Chris Knopp, Executive Director of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Uh, for over 40 years, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness has been the leader in protecting the boundary waters. And we have been that leader because of you. The strength of our organization um, is our, our thousands and thousands and thousands of supporters. And, and thank you so much for your passion for the Boundary Waters and uh, the support that you give our organization. Today, our work focuses on three areas, wilderness, people, and community. For the wilderness, we recognize that there are two mines and one threat to the Boundary Waters. Those two mines are polymet and twin metals, and the threat is sulfide mining. We are uh, uh, leading the fight with many other committed organizations to protecting the Boundary Waters from the threat of sulfide mining. Um, and through lawsuits, legislation, and community action. And we are very confident th that in the long run, we will be successful. And again, it will be because of the work that all of you are doing to protect the Boundary Waters. The second area of people. We have our, our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program in which we connect students of all backgrounds to the Boundary Waters through classroom education and now online programs and scholarships to provide students with uh, week-long wilderness canoe experiences. And then finally, community. We recognize the communities that are gateways to the Boundary Waters, Ely, Grand Marais, and the like, are, have a shared fate with the Boundary Waters itself. And we know that in order to protect the Boundary Waters, these communities must thrive. Today, I am so very, very excited to, uh, for uh, our presentation. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Lee Freelich here, the director of the University of Minnesota Center for Forest Ecology. He is a world-renowned uh, uh, forest researcher, uh, and his presentation is Climate Change um, and, uh, and the Boundary Waters. The climate change is an existential threat to, to all of us uh, and to our entire globe but it also affects very specifically the boundary waters. And Dr. Freelich will take a deep dive into the, the context of climate change globally and how it impacts uh, the boundary waters itself. And I want to uh, invite all of you uh, the, during the course of this um, uh, presentation to, to uh, ask uh, questions and provide comments at the bottom of your screen. If you, if you go there, you will be able to, you'll see a Q&A button and you'll see a chat button please provide uh, your questions there or your comments. Uh, at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, we are uh, looking very closely at the role uh, that the friends should play in, in, in how climate change impacts the, the boundary waters. And we want to have in, in, uh, invite you to provide your specific comments on and how you think the friends uh, should act uh, in, in, this, uh, in this space right now. So uh, Dr. Freelich has uh, decades of experience in in studying the boreal forest. He has authored over 160 papers on, on, on various topics related to forest ecology. And he's uh, appeared uh, widely in the media and the news. And he's uh, uh, you know, not just a treasure for the University of Minnesota and the, and the state of Minnesota, but, but, but truly uh, uh, for our country and the world in this, uh, in this space of studying uh, uh, forests. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over now. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Lee Freelich. Please take it away, please. Okay, um, thanks for that introduction. I'm happy to be here and to talk to you about climate change and how it may affect the boundary waters. And at the end, we'll get to what we can do about it and hopefully also questions um, from the audience. So, okay, it's working. Um, so we have a massive 200 year body of scientific evidence about climate change. And a lot of people don't realize that climate change science goes way back to Fourier in the 1820s, um, who discovered that greenhouse gases exist in the atmosphere. Um, another scientist um, named Tyndall um, proposed that carbon dioxide actually plays a role in climate change and um, then we finally have Dr. Seuss here on the, the right side. Not the Dr. Seuss you're probably thinking of. This is a, a Dr. Seuss who is an atmospheric physicist and he proved way back in the 1950s that the excess carbon dioxide appearing in the atmosphere actually did come from fossil fuels because it has a different isotopic signature than CO2 from natural sources like the ocean or from volcanoes. 
But then there's one more big player here, Arrhenius, who is a Swedish scientist, won the Nobel Prize in the early 1900s. And um, he won the Nobel Prize for discovering that chemical reactions go faster at high temperatures than low temperatures. But his real interest was the role of carbon dioxide in the history of the Earth. And he actually spent two years um, doing hand calculations to calculate how much the mean world temperature would rise if we doubled the CO2 content of the atmosphere. Um, no calculators, no computers, just all day long, every day with paper, paper and pencil doing these calculations. And he came up with four to six degrees Celsius for doubled CO2 content, which is exactly what we get with today's models. Of course, today we have projections by seasons of the year and different geographic areas of the earth that are getting to be quite accurate. But nevertheless, he published these first predictions for what would happen to the world as a whole in 1896. So that's how long we've known that rising CO2 levels caused by fossil fuels would in impact the mean temperature of the world. Um, and I like to tell people um, all Swedes are 100 years ahead of the rest of the world. Um, Arrhenius was actually you know, more than 100 years ahead of the rest of the world in these projections. So we also know that it's warmer than it's been in over 2,000 years by looking at old trees that are right at the edge of the tree line in Arctic region. For example, these trees in the Yamalia region of the northern Urals in Russia. And they are limited by temperature and length of summer. And as you can see on the graph there, they've been growing more in the last few decades than they have for the last 2,000 years. Um, trees are not Republicans or Democrats. Trees don't lie when you interview them. And examine their rings, they always tell the truth, and these trees are telling us that it's warmer than it's been in 2,000 years. Lots of other tree ring evidence from the bristle cone pines going back as far as 4,000 years, telling us that it's warmer now than it's been in quite some time. And this is a reconstruction of the world um, mean temperature from a variety of different sources and um, shows that the peak of the interglacial we're in was about four to 6,000 years ago and we had a natural cooling trend since then. And the red way over on the right is the warming trend in the last several decades caused by rising CO2 from fossil fuel burning by humans. And as you can see, we're already warmer than we were at the peak of the interglacial several thousand years ago. And then this is just an expansion of the last 140 years, starting in 1880, which was the first time that we had enough weather stations around the world to get a mean world temperature. So this is actual weather station data summarized for the world, showing that it's been warming quite rapidly, especially in the last four decades. Um, and it, this goes through 2018. If we had 2019 and 2020 on there, it's a continuation of, of this recent warmth. So where are we going to go in the future? Well, here's a graph showing 800,000 years of carbon dioxide concentration records. And you can see the glacial cycles there. Every time we're in an interglacial and it's warm, CO2 content was higher and during the glacial cycles it's um, lower. So there's been a correlation between CO2 levels and temperature that goes back at least 800,000 years, although we know now from some other data that actually we have more CO2 in the atmosphere now than we've had in three million years. Um, this is just how far back the ice record goes uh, in Antarctica. So are we going to go to that low emission scenario on the right and get up to maybe four or 500 million parts per million? Are we going to go on a high emission scenario and get up to 900 or 1,000 parts per million? 
Well, that remains to be determined, and I'll show you what the difference between the low and high emission scenario makes for the boundary waters in a minute here. So, and then here are alternative temperature scenarios for those two, the, the high emission on the left showing six to eight degrees Celsius of warming, which is about 10 to 14 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. Uh, and you can see the center part of North America is very, very warm there compared to the low emission scenario, which only warms us up by uh, one degree Celsius or maybe about one to two degrees Fahrenheit. So those are the alternative futures. And why do we really care about global warming? Why is it so important? Well, we know that of the five mass extinctions in the history of the Earth, we know that four of them occurred at times with rising CO2 levels. At those occasions, the rising CO2 came from natural sources. This time it's coming from humans. Um, even the great extinction, the end Permian, which was 250 million years ago, uh, was caused by rising CO2 level, levels. And there were volcanoes at that time that were so huge that they covered an area about half the size of the 48 states in the United States with lava about a half a mile deep, um, creating these huge rock formations, which are now basalt, which is essentially solidified um, lava. And we don't have any volcanoes anywhere near that big today on this planet. So today volcanoes are only contributing one to two percent as much CO2 as human emissions from burning fossil fuels. So we know that mass extinctions occur when fossil, when, when CO2 levels go up, this time it's fossil fuels and it could cause another mass extinction. And there are a number of tipping points, um, things that could happen in different places in the world that could cause a tipping point that could cause the CO2 concentrations to, to go up as feedbacks, not just because of burning of fossil fuels, but if it gets warm enough, then the earth itself will start emitting CO2. Uh, one of those is the Amazon rainforest, as you can see here, but Another one is the boreal forest between Lake Superior and Edmonton, Alberta, uh, which could convert over to prairie so that all that forest would die. Um, millions of square miles of forest could die and that would mean huge amounts of CO2 going into the atmosphere. And there really isn't a scenario for our planet that stops at four degrees Celsius, which is seven or eight degrees Fahrenheit. We either go up two or three degrees Fahrenheit, or we're going to cross some of these tipping points and it's going to be much, much warmer. Uh, because once you trip a tipping point, then CO2 comes out of the earth itself and there's nothing that can be done to stop it. So we're either going to go to lower emissions in the next decade or so, or we're going to have high emissions plus the feedbacks from the earth and it could end up as much as 20 degrees Fahrenheit uh, warmer than it is now. And the Boundary Waters is part of one of those tipping points. So let's talk a little bit about the boreal forest. So this is a map looking down on the North Pole shows the boreal forest going across Scandinavia and Russia, and then from Alaska across Canada. And there's a little part of it there that dips down into northeastern Minnesota. Essentially, just the arrowhead has a, has a boreal climate that supports uh, true boreal forest with spruce, fir, birch, and some pines, and also aspen and birch. So it's our little slice of the vast boreal forest. It's very vulnerable to climate change because it's on the very southern edge. Um, so what does it take? Well, either extreme winter cold, minus 45 Fahrenheit, uh, which is the deep super cooling limit for maple and oak, which would be your temperate forest species of trees. So they can deep super cool where, where their sap actually will not freeze until it gets down to minus 45. Well, 
in the old days, it used to get that cold in northern Minnesota and it could just directly kill maple and oak. These days, very seldom because of the warming that's already occurred, uh, where winters are substantially warmer than they used to be. But you can also get boreal forest if the summers are too cool and too short, which is also the case in northern Minnesota. And is today the case on Isle Royal and on the Door Peninsula in Wisconsin that because of cold water upwelling in the Great Lakes, either Superior or Michigan, you have boreal forests just because the summers are too cool um, to support those temperate species that have a longer cycle need a longer growing season. And this just shows the polar vortex of January 2019, which I'm sure most of you remember. And those dark pink areas here at 9 a.m. on the January 30 were minus 50. And the lighter pink was minus 30 to minus 40. And uh, if it was that cold every winter, just the winter could wipe out the temperate trees and keep it boreal. But that doesn't happen very often. And so we're talking about whether the summers are cool enough um, these days uh, to maintain boreal forest. And here again shows our slice of the boreal forest with jack pine, black and white spruce and balsam fir um, just to the northwest of Lake Superior in the Boundary Waters. And this is what it looks like. This is near Tedagoosh State Park in Minnesota. And you can see it's spruce and fir and birch about as far as you can see in every direction. That's also the case in the Boundary Waters. And summers are very cool here and that's the reason for this forest. It's not that the winters are too cold. Whereas in the Boundary Waters, it used to be winters that helped to maintain the boreal forest and now it's the, the cool summers. So how much might it warm in the future in this area? Well, this shows a high emission scenario in the upper, and it shows the middle of this century and the end of the century um, going as far out as 2070 to 2099. And the, the temperature scale here is actually in Fahrenheit because we used this um, slide, Don Wubbles and I used this slide in Washington, D.C., and they don't have Celsius there. They only have Fahrenheit in Washington, D.C. So, so you can see 12 or 13 Fahrenheit there for the high emission scenario. And that would make the Twin Cities as warm as Manhattan, Kansas, which is a small town to the west of Kansas City. It would make the Boundary Waters as warm as Omaha. And you might ask the question, can moose live in Omaha? And the answer is, if you provide the moose with a swimming pool filled with chilled water, yes, they can live in Omaha, otherwise they can't. The low emission scenario, warming it up about four to five degrees scenario, or, or um, degrees Fahrenheit would be, make the Bounty Waters as warm as perhaps Grand Rapids to St. Cloud. Um, it would still be cool enough to have a few conifers around. There would be changes, but nowhere near the drastic change we'd get with the high emission scenario. The Twin Cities would warm up about as much as Des Moines, Iowa. So at this point, that's the best scenario we can hope for, um, is just a, a slightly higher CO2 content and, and maybe two to four degrees Fahrenheit of warming in summer temperature. And what would the, the high emission scenario, where it's 10 to 13 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, what would difference would that make? Well, tree species ranges would move at least 300 miles to the north. So here you can see balsam fir abundance in the upper left. The bright red colors is where there's a lot of balsam fir. That's our favorite Christmas tree in Minnesota and you can see it's very abundant in northeastern Minnesota and for the high emission scenario in the right lower right it would essentially be gone uh, from the state of Minnesota. Very similar results for black spruce, white spruce, and paper birch. So I had a PhD student, Nick Fizzichelli, who is now um, out at Acadia National Park in Maine and he looked at these gradients 
across from very boreal places like Grand Marais out to the edge of the prairie near Itasca State Park where you go from lots and lots of conifers like spruce and fir to just a few of them when you get out near the prairie edge. And he looked, um, how does the summer temperature affect the abundance of the conifers versus things like maple and oak? And so he looked at growth rates across that gradient from very cool summers to warmer summers um, for these species, balsam, fir, white spruce, red maple, sugar maple, and red oak, the, looked at the rings and also the height growth rate of the saplings in the understory of the forest and found this relationship where with cool summers where the mean summer temperature is 63 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like Grand Marais, um, fir and spruce grow more than maple. And right around 64 to 65, there's a tipping point where they grow equally well. And at 66 degrees mean summer temperature, the maples and also oak grow better than spruce and fir. And so if you look at a place like Duluth, from 1960 to 1990, it was in that range where the fir and spruce would definitely grow more than the maple. Right now, they're right at the tipping point, and in just a few more years here, if the warming continues, they'll be into the zone where the maples will outgrow the spruce and fir and therefore be able to replace them. So you would have a slow replacement of the boreal forest by maples and also oak. And here's an example of that. This is Newport State Park. It's in Wisconsin, um, but it's where there's cold water upwelling in Lake Michigan. And when I was there in 1979, there was no maple here. It was all spruce and fir. And you can see the balsam fir saplings there on the left and a sugar maple sapling on the right, which is growing at about the same rate as the fir sapling. So it's right at that tipping point now in temperature. And the maple is actually moving into this boreal forest because it got just a tiny bit warmer than it was 40 years ago. So there's actually at these boundaries between temperate and boreal forest, there are temperate tree seedlings moving in under the boreal forest. And these boundaries are all over the place in northern Minnesota. Uh, like you see the picture here on the North Shore. And the boreal, which are the dark green trees here are actually moving in underneath, uh, or the maples, excuse me, are moving in under the dark green um, in the form of seedlings. So they might be the next generation of trees. It hasn't warmed up enough yet to directly kill the boreal trees, but yet the temperate trees like maple and oak have been freed from their temperature limitations. And so they're invading. So we have more mixed temperate and boreal forests forming at this point in time. Um, the temperate trees will gradually replace the boreal and at some point it might get warm enough to directly kill the boreal trees. So here's a blowdown. You, you remember the big blowdown of July 4th, 1999. And here's a before picture on the left and an after picture on the right. At that time, the entire understory of the forest, the the trees waiting on the forest floor for the bigger trees in the canopy to die were all boreal trees. Um, in the blown down picture there, you can see a lot of green and those are fir trees and spruce trees that were in the understory. When the big trees blew down, they're waiting to take over. So it's boreal trees taking over small boreal trees instead of big ones because the big ones blew down. If you look in a lot of places in northern Minnesota now, it's a different story. There's a lot of maple in the understory of the forest like you see here. This was taken in late September and the maple has turned red um, in this boreal forest, which is paper birch, spruce, and fir. So as the birch die or if this forest were to blow down, it would be instant conversion from boreal forest to temperate forest because those temperate seedlings are waiting in the understory. So we could have um, a takeover of these here 
you've got black and white spruce, fir, jack pine, red pine, quaking birch, uh, quaking aspen, and paper birch. That's the suite of, of important tree species in the boreal forest of northern Minnesota. And you could end up having these species, in addition to maple, have these species taken over. And you see bur oak and Kentucky coffee tree and basswood three species of elm here, and there's a hickory and also hackberry. These are all species that could move into the boundary waters. The um, basswood and the bur oak are already there. Some of the elms are already there. The hickory and the, the hackberry and the coffee tree would have to move a ways to get there, but um, temperate trees are expanding already, especially red maple in the boundary waters. So, with warmer summers, temperate forests could replace the boreal, but what about the prairie? Maybe there won't be any trees at all. Um, it turns out the prairie depends on water balance. And so another PhD student, Nick Dons, who's now a professor at the University of Wisconsin Superior, did this research and discovered that our original prairie forest border in Minnesota that was mapped out by the land surveyors just prior to European settlement showed that that border was right where the precipitation minus um, evaporation was zero. So the water balance was zero in places where there was more rainfall than evaporation, which is shown in green and blue in the map on the right, supported forests. And then, so the zero or negative water balance area supported grasslands. So the question is, where is that zero water balance where there's as much evaporation as there is precipitation? Where will that go in that, that high emission scenario um, as opposed to the low emission scenario? Well, the answer is probably also about 300 miles to the northeast. So the prairie forest border could move up to um, Thunder Bay or Grand Marais, the boundary waters could be right at the edge of the prairie forest border. So it might end up being a mixture of temperate maple and oak forests and some prairie, especially prairies out in the western part of the boundary waters. And if you look further west, um, this is out in Alberta. The prairie forest border continues from Minnesota out to um, near Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, this picture shows an aspen forest that has died. This is a July picture and it has died because of severe drought stress. Um, and you can see it's prairie mixed with forest here. It's right at the edge of the prairie forest border. And it's only a matter of time until this drying and increased evaporation makes its way east to Minnesota. In addition to that, when the trees are under drought stress, um, the birch trees on the North Shore have been dying because even with the increased rainfall in recent years, there's still a lot of drought stress because there's so much more evaporation with longer summers and warmer summers. When trees are under drought stress, you get insect infestations and the, the, the right picture here shows lodgepole pine out west infested with mountain pine beetle, which is a native beetle out there, but its population used to be kept in check by uh, extremely cold winter temperatures, but not anymore. So it's had an explosion and killed many millions of acres of lodgepole pine. Turns out lodgepole pine is a close relative of jack pine. And one of our graduate students discovered recently that the beetles do, in fact, um, like jack pine. They can use it. If they can get here, they can also kill jack pine and to a certain extent red pine and white pine. Um, they can use and kill all three of our native pine species in Minnesota. It's just a matter of getting a bunch of winters that don't have minus 40 temperatures so that they can move across from Saskatchewan across Manitoba into northern Minnesota. Then of course more wind and fire in a warming climate too. More wind storms and more forest fires and you can see in the lower left there that's Seagull Lake. The areas that 
burned in high intensity fires in the mid 2000s. Um, I think this is the Cavity Lake fire of 2006 after the blowdown of 1999. So that's the type of landscape you get um, when you have wind throw followed by fire, which is gonna be way more common in a, in a warmer climate than what we have now. So droughts, bugs, and fires and windstorms. And then we have these weird early springs now. You know, sometimes spring is normal, but sometimes it's incredibly early, like March of 2012. You might remember the jet stream had this weird pattern showed on, on the left there where tropical air got all the way up to Hudson's Bay in the middle of March and we had spring break here on campus where it was 85 degrees and we had magnolias in bloom by the 27th of March uh, in Minnesota. And what happened to the boreal forest? Well, Here's a picture, the, the picture on the left is one of our study areas in the Boundary Waters and you can see the um, post-fire regeneration there that, in other words, jack pine that regenerated after the fires of 2006 and 2007 have turned brown. And then there's win winter browning of spruce here up near Thunder Bay in the lower picture, that's a white spruce forest taken from the air Spruce and jack pine does not know what to do with a six or seven month growing season, does not have the ability to respond in a reasonable way to having it be 85 degrees in the middle of March. Um, and so they turned brown by May. And these trees did recover, but if there were two springs in a row like this, their energy stores would be exhausted and they would not be able to grow new foliage and they would die. So with the high emission scenario, we, uh, an average spring would be like the spring of 2012. So this phenological, which refers to the timing of natural events, this phenological upset that could occur with early springs could become very commonplace in future years and definitely by 2080 or 2090 this could wipe out the boreal forest if not sooner than that even if all the other things didn't happen. So converting from boreal forest to savanna or to temperate forest, warmer summers, allowing maple and oak to replace spruce and fir, wind plus fire, um, opening up the forest, allowing oaks or allowing prairies to invade heat and drought stress, insect infestation due to lack of extreme cold that used to control the insects. And then these early springs or phenological disturbance as we're calling it could all contribute to decline of forests in the boundary waters. And so here's, if you turn the, the previous slides I talked about into rules for mapping biomes. So boreal forest versus mixed boreal and temperate versus temperate forest. So spruce and ver, fir versus mixed spruce and fir with maple and oak and, and pure maple and oak forest is mean summer temperature and it shows the tipping point there, 64.6 degrees mean summer temperature. If it's colder than 62 degrees in continental areas like northern Minnesota or 59.5 degrees in maritime areas like Grand Marais or the Keweenaw Peninsula, you get pure boreal forest, you get mixed in the middle and if it's warmer than 66.4 it's going to be pure maple and oak. And then the climatic moisture index, precipitation minus um, evapotranspiration. If that's zero, you're right at the prairie forest border. If it's a two inch deficit or more, you're into prairie. If it's a two inch surplus in, in precipitation, you're into forest. So if you just turn these into mapping rules, you can make maps based on future climate projections. And these are those maps. So you see the current using the climate from the last 20 years on the left. And you see boreal forest there in the blue uh, in the eastern part of the boundary waters. And then it 
kind of goes into mixed forest where there's some temperate and some maple and oak present, but still mostly boreal in the western boundary waters and the prairies way out there at the western edge of Minnesota. Um, with the low scenario, the low emission scenario, we would retain some boreal forest in northeastern Minnesota. It would be pushed out a little bit, um, but conifers would still remain and even some true boreal forest in the eastern boundary waters. Whereas with the high emission scenario, the future looks dramatically different. The boreal forest would be completely gone, even mixed temperate and boreal forest would be completely gone from northern Minnesota. The arrowhead could have some maple and oak forest, which is that kind of light yellow coloring, and the prairie and savanna, oak savanna, would move in from the west and occupy almost the entire state, um, including the western part of the boundary waters. You can see the whole western part of Minnesota there um, being solid prairie for that high scenario by 2070. And in fact, if you take Kansas, which you can see a little bit down in the lower left corner there, and kind of turn it vertically and slide it up into Minnesota, we have a whole new Kansas being created there in Minnesota. Um, and I was quoted in the the Washington Post uh, a few months ago as saying that we have a perfectly good Kansas now in Kansas and we really don't need to create a second Kansas in Minnesota. So let's do the low scenario, keep our boreal forest and keep forest and especially conifer forest in the boundary waters. What does this look like in pictures? Um, so here's a picture showing boreal forest where the blue star is up in the boundary waters in Quetico. And then the orange star is a place that right now has a summer climate like, like the boundary waters could have by the year 2070. And that is near Granite Falls, Minnesota. And we found a place there that has the same type of rock, the same physiography, the same soils. The only difference is it's eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer in summer. So here's the boundary waters, black spruce growing on rock. Um, and here is the same type of rock, same type of, of landscape setting warmed up by eight degrees Fahrenheit nice outcrops natural area next to the city of Granite Falls, Minnesota. And you can see scattered trees, some prairie vegetation. And again, that's both growing on granitic shell rock, shallow soils. That's the difference of eight degrees in summer temperature from that um, to that. So quite a difference. And then of course, when you change the vegetation, it changes the wildlife. And these are some examples. So lynx would, would disappear and be replaced by bobcat. As the vegetation changed, bobcats can get along in kind of mixed grassland and forested areas, whereas lynx require more dense forest and especially a long duration of snow cover each winter. Moose being replaced by deer. Moose would have heat stroke with the warmer summers. Um, as I said earlier, moose can't live in Omaha unless they have a swimming pool with chilled water. Deer can do just fine. And then blackback woodpecker turning into or being replaced by red-bellied woodpecker. There are already red-bellied woodpeckers in northern Minnesota in the Ely area. And I was surprised to find that. So, um, this is a slide I actually made for Amy Klobuchar. She was giving a speech about climate change on the floor of the Senate and she said, do you have any slides? And I said, sure, I do. I mean, who's gonna say no to, to Amy? So, so I made this slide and it, it kind of shows my estimation of the level at which the US Senate can understand climate change. I mean, if moose turn into deer, they can understand that, right? Um, so that um, brings us to the end here. And I just wanted to point out this picture here um, that was made by David Luke, who's a professor of photography in, in the Minnesota State University, I think in Normandale in Bloomington. And he took 
kind of quintessential pictures, iconic pictures of the Boundary Waters now, and then digitally erased the forest above the water and replaced it with prairie pictures or oak savanna pictures that he took in southern Minnesota. So here you see the, the original or the, the currently existing boreal forest reflected in the water um, at Duncan Lake in the Bounty Waters and then oak and oak tree there and, and prairie up above. So he's got a whole bunch of these that is a traveling art exhibit and I'm trying to encourage him to make it into a book where every side by side page would be the current Boundary Waters and the future Boundary Waters. Um, and with that, oh, I was going to say a few words about how to solve the problem of climate change. Um, stop subsidizing fossil fuels like the government does here with hundreds of billions of dollars a year, switch to renewable energy, solar, wind, increase energy efficiency, stop deforestation, especially in tropical areas, regenerative agriculture, to start putting CO2 back into the soil and eat more plants um, because growing vegetables has a much smaller carbon footprint than, than growing meat. So those are some solutions to the problem and um, I believe at this point we should switch back to Chris so that we can, um, he can send questions my way that come from the audience. Great, Mike. Thank you so much, Dr. Freelich, for uh, your um, uh, comprehensive and, and sobering presentation here. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, a lot to absorb and to, to think what the next, uh, next decades would bring to, to the Boundary Waters here. Uh, before I get to some questions, I want to uh, point out for, for everyone, uh, if you would please check out the website for our uh, uh, affiliate, our, our, our sibling organization, Friends of the Boundary Waters Action Network at www.bwcapac.org. Uh, Friends of the Boundary Waters Action Network is the, the political arm of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. It allows us to do enhanced advocacy work and, uh, and um, uh, uh, election work with, with candidates. So, so please check that out. You'll get a lot of good information about how uh, uh, you can help and how we're interacting in, in that space here. Um, we, to start things off, I want you to go back uh, to the slide where you show the browning of the spruce. Okay. There. Yeah, that. In, in this one, so so what what we saw here was the the impact of a, of the the change in the jet stream that brought uh, uh, 85 degree Fahrenheit uh, springs to the University of Minnesota campus where the magnolias were in bloom here, and 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 so what uh, what your what your often people have it uh, uh, the the sense that climate change you'll see that sort of gradual introduction of the temperate species like maple. But what you said is that if we had two springs like that, that happened uh, in, in, 20, in March of 2012, that everything, that the boreal forest could die off in, in, in one fell swoop like that. Would you, would you expand on that again? Yeah, because the, if you look at the, here then on the left, the, where was it warmer than average like that? much warmer than a typical spring and it's literally from Lake Winnipeg all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean and from the Canadian border all all the way up to the the southern part of Hudson's Bay so if this happened twice in a row it could wipe out all that boreal forest from Lake Winnipeg all the way out to the to the ocean um, so you would see this browning the first year and the second year they the trees would try to to put on another crop of needles and they would be killed again. And at that point, they would have exhausted their energy supply and we could wipe out that vast swath of boreal forest in one fell swoop. Um, so that, and then all those trees would burn or decompose and that would raise the CO2 content of the, the earth globally, be a very significant upward bump. Um, and, uh, that would be an incredible catastrophe for the whole world. And, and so, Lee, uh, expanding on, on that point, that there's there's not really sort of a, a middle ground here, right? We, we have a controlled scenario 
of, of two, two to two and a half degrees, or we have uh, one in which, in which we have a feedback loop where things get, you know, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Would you talk a little bit about that, how, how there's not, not a six degree scenario or eight degree scenario? Right. Right, yeah, either we're gonna stay at two degrees Celsius, which is three or four Fahrenheit, and that won't kick in a lot of these natural feedbacks in the earth, or we'll go beyond that and the feedbacks will kick in and those could be the loss of these forests that I just described. It can be the CO2 coming out of the tundra up in the Arctic in Siberia, Northern Canada and Alaska and CO2 coming out of the ocean because there's huge stores of, of frozen methane, um, which actually freezes at a temperature above the freezing point of water called um, methane hydrates or clathrates um, in the Arctic Ocean. And all that could start coming out and we could be into a, a feedback that we can't control where the, the world would warm up maybe as much as 15 or 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And you know that would really bring civilization to an end. The, the world would go on in the absence of people and the, the regrowth of trees after that would bring things back in balance, um, maybe in as little as five or 10,000 years. And even all the extinctions that we caused would be made up for in five to 10 million years um, through evolution of new species. And then the world would go on for hundreds of millions of years just fine in the absence of, of people. Um, but it's all about whether we're going to turn the world into a place that is no longer our home and no longer habitat suitable for people. There are a number, a number of questions related to the impact of uh, of, uh, of climate change on uh, invasive species. and. Uh, and uh, uh, in the, I'd like you to, to expand on a couple things. There's a specific question about, uh, is the spruce budworm infestation throughout the boundary waters related to, uh, to climate change? Um, it, it ha it's affected somewhat by climate change, but not a lot really. And the main um, thing about spruce budworm is it has a certain climatic zone where it lives. Uh, it has to have conifers, so if it gets too warm for conifers, especially a balsam fir, it can't survive there. And if the winters are too cold, the insect can be killed. So if you go a few hundred miles north of the Canadian border, straight north of Minnesota, you come to areas where, where balsam fir can grow without being killed by the insect. And so the insect might be able to move further north up there and cause infestations. Um, and it might actually uh, infest northern Minnesota a little bit less, but it's it's not going to be a huge impact compared to the fact that a warmer climate might wipe out fur, and um, there just wouldn't be any fir trees for the spruce budworm to live in, and that's likely to be a bigger impact than the spruce budworm itself, uh, because younger fir trees produce chemicals. Uh, that, are, that um, defend the tree from spruce budworm. And when they get to be about 40 years old, they stop producing those chemicals and then they become susceptible. And that's why there's little patches of older fir trees that are dying and younger ones that are regenerating all across Northeastern Minnesota. So um, that dynamic will continue up until the point that the fir trees can't grow there any longer because the climate is too warm. Thank you. Are there, uh, what invasive species are we seeing because of climate change? <clears throat> well, depending on your um, definition of invasive, I mean, you could say that red maple is an invasive in the boundary waters, uh, although it's native in Minnesota, and um, we tend to call those types of species that are moving north because of a warmer climate neonatives. So if you're in Quetico Provincial Park and the, you know, all these red maple trees invade from Minnesota. It, it's a neo-native because it's kind of expected that native trees will expand the northern edge of their range. Mm -hmm. But if you look at 
the true invasives, the ones that come from other continents like buckthorn. Um, buckthorn grows just fine in Ely and it's been there for several decades. So we're not really sure if it's limited by the climate at all, as opposed to the seed source. You know, there, there's nowhere near the seed source of buckthorn in Ely that there was in the Twin Cities, for example, where hundreds of thousands of people planted hedges with it 40 or 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but it will allow them to grow faster and spread faster. You know, everything grows faster in a warmer climate. So it would allow things like buckthorn and garlic mustard to grow and spread much faster with longer summers, even if they can just barely withstand the climate that's there now. Um, the earthworm invasion would spread faster. Um, there's many different species of invasive earthworms and they all have different temperature limits for how cold the soil can get in the winter. So that would, would be impacted. There's one European earthworm species that comes from the very northern part of Europe in Finland and adjacent Russia um, that is essentially can withstand Siberian temperatures. And so that one might um, be negatively impacted because it might become too warm. Whereas other things like night crawlers and these Asian worms that are just starting to invade Minnesota, the so-called jumping worms, they would probably do better in northern Minnesota with a warmer climate because they're kind of right at the edge of their zone. So lots of earthworm species, they're all invasive in Minnesota and they all have different temperature limits. So they could be in, impacted in various ways. Dr. Freelich, we have a, a, a question that uh, that goes goes to uh, uh, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Management. That that and it 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 goes to the heart of the uh, whether the philosophy behind the Wilderness Act of 1964 um, uh, doesn't doesn't reflect the real world. That is that is. Uh, uh, at what point might the BWCAW need to be a managed landscape? What is the line between leaving it alone and protecting it by preventing uh, markedly adverse activities such as uh, such as mining and actively managing it? But maybe f focusing on the, you know the the climate change uh, a aspect uh, as well that it's it's not there's not a fence around the boundary waters that stops the the outside impacts, right? Yeah, that's right. Um at the time that the Wilderness Act was, was written in, uh, in 1964, and even the 1978 Act that, that uh, for the, specifically for the Boundary Waters, people really thought that you could draw a line around a wilderness area and that it would take care of itself indefinitely. Mm -hmm. But we know now that that's not the case, even really big wilderness areas. Uh, like the Boundary Waters and even the Boundary Waters and Quetico combined, we'll see huge impacts of not only climate change, but some of these invasive species and fragmentation impacts coming from all the second homes around the edge and from harvesting trees and building mines and all sorts of things, the effects of which can propagate 10 to 20 miles into the wilderness. So the question is, you know, um, are there certain types of impacts that we would want to manage for? And for example, keeping buckthorn out. Um, my guess is that a lot of people might want to manage to keep buckthorn out. Let's say the climate becomes optimal for buckthorn and it starts to spread massively because it can grow faster than it used to. Uh, people might want to keep that out and that would require um, well, actually, I'm not sure if it would require changes in management because I know they've gone out and they do have a botanist who goes out and marks the location of invasive plants and they do make attempts to exterminate them when they're still quite small in the boundary waters. So that the interpretation of the Wilderness Act seems to be that that's okay. The question becomes what happens if that's way more massive because of a warmer climate and invading species just spread so much more rapidly and it becomes really massive. I mean, my guess is that we can't keep things like red maple out. 
and um, if the climate continues to warm, we're gonna have to live with moving into different forest types. If we really do go on that high emission scenario and the Boundary Waters wants to become a savanna, we might as well make it a really good savanna with nice grasslands and bur oak trees. Bur oak is already present in several locations in the Boundary Waters, by the way. Little blue stem, is, which is a, a native grass found on savannas, is already present in scattered locations. Um, so just manage it in a way to help those native species move in and avoid the non-native things uh, that might jump in there at the time that the, the native vegetation that's there now is under stress. That's always a time that invasive species could move in and, and become dominant. So make sure that um, it makes a graceful transition. And we might even have to bring some of the savanna species that can't get there on their own up there from southern Minnesota because the, the savanna remnants are tiny little postage stamps and many of the species can't cross 100 miles of corn and then a couple, another 100 miles of, of temperate forest in order to get to the boundary waters. Um, so that's something we might have to consider in the future is whether we wanna actually bring in some of the native species that would form the, the new ecosystem. That might require a revision to the Wilderness Act and you may not want to open up the Wilderness Act because once you do, who knows what amendments might be thrown in by various politicians. Um, mm -hmm. That tends to be the sort of thing that I throw over to social scientists and political scientists to deal with. I mean, I can tell you what the scientific con uh, consequences would be from the point of view of a scientist. I may not be that good at solving the social and political problems that would arise from from that type of revision to the law? Well, there, were, there was a, uh, a particular, following the, the 1999 blowdown, there was a, a real, a particular question where this, this came up, whether jack pine uh, uh, should be reseeded in, in the boundary waters, and in fact, interjecting the, the hand of humans in, into, into the boundary waters. And the, the answer to that was no, right? That we right. would not do that. And so what, what was the impact of, of that decision, Lee? Well, the impact was basically that a lot of the blow down, blown down forest that burned in the Cavity Lake and Ham Lake fires of 2006 and 2007, mm -hmm. they uh, regenerated to birch and aspen without a lot of pine. And that's because the jack pine had all blown down and their cones were all down on the ground then, so they were actually in the flames. Whereas in a standing jack pine forest, the flames do go through the upper canopy, but they only last a few minutes up there. And there's, the cones are good enough insulation that the seeds survive. And in fact, jack pine is adapted to actually that type of fire. Whereas down on the ground, the fire lasts for a half an hour to an hour, sometimes even several hours, it can keep smoldering. And the flames are much more intense and longer lasting and so, they were destroyed and there was no seed source. And so a lot of jack pine forest ended up being birch and aspen. And so there was no, and the only reason is there was no seed of jack pine. So we could have retained a lot more jack pine forest um, if we had seeded. I mean, the seed could have been dropped from a helicopter or people could have taken it in by hand on the ground. But other people might argue that the blowdown followed by those burns is also a natural process and, and that combination of disturbance did occur before European settlement. It wasn't as common as it is now, but you know, creating aspen and birch forests in that manner, you could argue that it's okay. Um, but you know, the do nothing route is always the easiest decision to make. So let nature take its course is always e the easier decision and that's what happened. So we now have a lot more aspen and birch forest in the Boundary Waters than we did um, even 30 or 40 years ago. 
you know, a final question here that uh, uh, one, one uh, participant here has observed a different uh, bird species. And, and so is, is that an impact a, a, as well of climate change that the, uh, the, uh, one of our participants is, is seeing a lot more robins this year uh, and, and, and less of uh, uh, gray jays and, and the like. So is, is, that, is that the case as well, uh, Dr. Friedlich? Uh, yeah, certainly the climate is marginal for robins up there, although they can get along with um, through winter by being through with human provided seed or food sources. Um, so it's a combination of the fact that people are living outside the boundary waters and providing new food sources that robins didn't have before, plus the fact that the climate is becoming more habitable for robins. But Certainly there are lots and lots of bird species that are native just to the south that are moving north and they can move north pretty fast, much faster than trees can. You know, hence the fact that red-bellied woodpeckers have already made their way up to the boundary waters from Iowa. Um, so they can move in as soon as the climate is no longer limiting for them. But then there's also the fact that people feed birds and, and do other things to the landscape outside the boundary waters that provides sources of food. So it's a combination of direct human impacts and climate impacts. Okay, thanks. Lee, if you'd uh, please move the, the, the slide presentation to the last slide here. Mm -hmm. Let's see, this one. Yes, and uh, everyone, uh, I. Uh, I invite you to send your, your uh, comments and, and, and thoughts to us about the, the friends and engagement with, with climate change and its impact on, on the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. It's a, uh, a topic where, we're, again, we're looking into as an organization, and we uh, want your input and thoughts uh, in, in, in that. Uh, Dr. Freelich, your presentation, again, was, was tremendous and, and very sobering and uh, uh, is, is a, uh, should be a wake-up call uh, for everyone. Um, I know we did not get to all the, all the questions out there. Um, we, uh, please feel free to follow up uh, with us. Uh, I know there were questions about whether this will be recorded and, and yes, this, this presentation will, will be recorded and you will receive a link to it that you can get send on to, to uh, families and friends uh, uh, as well. Uh, our next uh, presentation will be on August 5th, Wednesday, August 5th at 12 noon. And it will be on Lost in the Wild, a Tale of Survival in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. We will have uh, 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 the author, Carrie Griffith, who uh, wrote this, this book here, uh, Lost in the Wild. And he will give a presentation about uh, a real life uh, story of, of survival in the Boundary Waters. You will, you will uh, definitely want to take that in. Uh, again, uh, thank you everyone for being part of uh, this this um, um, this webinar this afternoon. You are the strength of our organization, and and thank you so much to to Dr. Freelich. It was great, and and uh, you are uh, again a, a real uh, a giant in in the field. And thank you for for uh, sharing your expertise with all of us this afternoon. Sure, okay. you're you're welcome. Okay. Everyone, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Well, I guess that went pretty well. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Sure. All right. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Take care. Yep.